much for spending some of your time with us here today. You know, I'd love to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, I'd be so excited to connect with you on Instagram or on Facebook, on at Extraordinaires Podcast on either of those platforms, and of course on the Teresa Livingston YouTube channel. If you happen to be watching on YouTube right now, totally this one is for you. And if you're listening on podcast, mwah, big, uh, big love and safe, healthy, no COVID kisses to you. <laughs> As I record this, it is mid-August 2020. I'm still at home, just like everybody else in the world, it feels like. Will and I are still testing positive for COVID-19. Yay. Deep in the heart of COVID. Yeah. As I sit here and spray tiny droplets of ever so slightly infected saliva onto my microphone and my husband's iPad. My guest today is really thrilled that she's there at home and not across the way from me. I mean, we feel fine. All the symptoms are gone. But for one and a half months, we have been testing positive for COVID. Not COVID. <laughs> not the COVID. Uh, for COVID-19. Isn't it strange? Is someone else out there in the same boat as us? Is this common? Is this weird? <laughs> Talk to me, Goose. Oh, what a world. And yet here we are, I'm feeling alive, I'm feeling well, I'm safe, I'm healthy, I'm well fed, really, really well fed because <laughs> Will loves to cook and that's been most of the joy he's been finding being locked in is cooking these delicious meals because, you know, he loves me only slightly more than butter. I'm mostly grateful to have a home and to have the space uh, to be creative and to seek out extraordinaires just like my very special guest today. She is here to remind us that there is a superhero living inside of all of us. I'm thrilled to introduce this wonder woman of many gifts and talents to you. You know, I love to share with you the discovery of uh, extraordinary people with extraordinary stories, doing extraordinary things in the world. Today, we're talking about self-worth. How do we get it? How can we overcome the experiences and circumstances in life that keep us small and keep us lacking the confidence to believe in ourselves enough to take those risks that we need to do to expand and succeed? I saw this woman online uh, giving a talk to a group of women about her experiences in life, her struggles, how she suffered for many, many years through uh, sexual abuse as a child, a very young child, and how she's come out the other side actually writing books and sharing tools on how to cultivate self-worth. The way she speaks is uplifting. You can tell she's a wonderful life coach, which is what she does with most of her time. It's clear she is a woman who has done the work, the hard work to fully heal, and now it compels her to want to help others. Just so you have some idea, I'm going to rattle off a few bullet points of her resume um, so you can feel half as lazy and uh, unaccomplished as I did when I read her resume uh, for the first time. I, I dare you to hold your breath. Tahera Renee Christie is a successful and powerful life coach. She's also a relationship coach. She is a writer and author of two published books. One is called uh, How to Deal with Your Baby Daddy, <laughs> A Woman's Guide to Effective Co-Parenting and Preservation of Self. And the second is A Safe Place for Us, a healing journal for women of color. She began her own nonprofit, an organization she calls Encore Presentation Inc. It's an organization that focuses on bringing healthy self-esteem and self-confidence to underserved communities. She's a singer and a songwriter, and she just released an album. It's titled Just Let Me. She's also a comedian, a stand-up comedian, and actor, and a DJ. And in all that spare time, she recently created and launched her own line of natural ingredient skincare product. It's called Love A More Proper, or Propre, 
however you might say that in a Parisian accent, because uh, that means self-love in French. I wouldn't have known that if she hadn't have told me. She is the host of her own podcast. It's called Filter Free with Tahera Renee Christie. And through the creation of all these all-consuming, wonderfully artistic endeavours, she remained an attentive mother to four children. I mean, for most of that time, she was a single mother of four children. That's an extraordinary task in and of itself. This is a woman who will never have to say to herself, what if? Because... It seems to me that Tahera Renee Christie just goes out and does it. And I am really dying to see what her superpower is. I'm already inspired and excited for you to be too. Would you please welcome Wonder Woman extraordinaire Tahera Renee Christie. Yay! I'm giving you a, um, applause. Here we go. Applause. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Hi, Tahera. Oh, Hello. I am blessed. I'm blessed. I'm wonderful. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I'm here. That's how I feel. Mm-hmm. Many people can't really say the same at this given moment. So, yeah, be grateful for the little things, right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Where in the world are you? Are you in the Mar- I'm in, I am in uh, Mission Viejo, California. So I'm in the middle of South Orange County. You could consider me a, an Orange County housewife, but I don't think I fit the demographic. <laughs> Even though it's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I do either, but then I'm not really one of those. Oh, my gosh. Uh, thanks for being here with us. This is what you do in life, right? I wanted to work backwards, but, but for the, the big picture, uh, we just shared all the amazing things that you do. But your main your main passion in life, would you call that your, your life coaching, your relationship coaching, your being of service to others? Absolutely. I feel like many people are looking for their purpose in life, but their purpose is as simple as something as helping people. Mm -hmm. And the output of that purpose is many different outputs. And you can sing a song and move people. You can write a small letter or, you know, help someone take in their groceries, whatever that is in order to showcase that, um, that help, that love. And for me, it's, I've just been through a lot. I've got already kind of told me at a young age, you're just going to be the first one to do everything. And people are going to follow you after you've done it, which means that I'm the first one to fail, the first one to fall, the first one to get hurt and cry and, and have issue. So it, it becomes like a double-edged sword of there's really not anyone there to guide me per se all the time. When I go through things, I kind of just have to figure them out. But once I have my superpower is giving it away um, and giving it to someone else who, who doesn't have to go through the level of pain that I've gone through. So while I can look at it as woe is me, I can also look at it as, wow, that's me. And that's the reason I'm as great as I am, not because of, uh, or in spite of, but because of, you know, I, I, I embrace all of the things that I've been through in life. I, it reminds me of, you know, many people that I know that are, like you say, woe is me. They're yeah. powerful, inspirational leaders, but it's easy to feel like you're being put upon. But when you reframe yes. it, that you are the one who has the potential and the gift to be able to lead. I mean, that's just what it is. It's a gift. And I'm sure that's part of where your, um, the value of yourself comes from, right? Realizing that you're a leader. Absolutely. I, I think that <laughs> my grandfather used to say all the time, because I was always the kid who was getting in trouble. Uh, he would say, to Tahara was over there at the bus stop, entertaining all the kids, making them laugh. And whereas all my aunts and my mom and my dad and, and, my, and some of the other adults in my life, they were like, she's always in trouble. She's getting suspended. She's been acting up. Well, it was me acting out because I had real deep rooted issues that I didn't know how to express or explain. These weren't necessarily things that the generations before me had gone through. And I was paving a new way. And when you're doing anything new, you're going to come across controversy. But in my eight year old, 10 year old, 15 year old brain, I didn't know how to quantify that and really um, soothe myself from it other than writing. So that was my I couldn't talk to anybody. So I, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote my first journal. I think I was nine years old and I still have it. I have all my journals from when I was nine going forward. And it could make you cry if you read uh, my journals and details. But the reality is now I smile because, man, uh, the, the journey has been um, amazing, mm. um, full of ups and downs, you know, just like the tides of the shore. Um, the water comes in and it recedes and it cleanses itself. Mm. And that's what's happened with me. And and I'm 40 now and I'm thank God for 40 and seeing this day because it's all been worth it because mm. I am truly living my best life now. Mm. When you say that, it reminds me, um, one of my, uh, I teach a lot of yoga and one of my, I use the word gurus, would use this lovely analogy where it's like, 
and they could use the tide and the water. You know, you've got the sediment down the bottom of a cup, right? Mm-hmm. It's the sediment. It's the truth. It's the it's the essence of you that has to come out. And unless yeah. you like churn up the water in the cup enough to move the sediment, which is the getting into trouble, which is the testing your boundaries. You're never going to move the sediment, right? You have to shake the glass so you can, Absolutely. you know, get to it. I, 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 I dig that a lot. Um, w- so what's your sediment then? Like what happened? Your writing was a thing that brought you out. And of course, in order for us to show your light, I want to, we have to share your dark, right? This is yeah, how absolutely. we get to it. So do you want to share a little bit with the viewers, like just what you had to overcome? Yeah. Oh gosh. This could be a, a, an eight hour long podcast and, we could just <laughs> on and, on and on and I would take sips of water and keep going. Like I was on the, the, the floor of the house or the Senate, but uh, <laughs> to, to make a very long dramatic uh, story short um, from the time that I was three until the time I was 13, I was molested. And I can't tell you how many people because it is un, it's unnumberable. I'm thinking around 30 men, women, boys, girls um, took advantage of me sexually. Um, and it was because I was that was my earliest memory. I it was ingrained in me as a child that I was a sexual object there to please someone else's sexual desires and needs. When I got older and I learned uh, what Reiki healing was and I learned about aligning chakra, um, I was able to go back in that space and relive that part of my life to understand why some of the decisions that I made were what they were. And the most profound thing that is scary but understandable to me at this point in my life was because my light was so big, people oftentimes with their own darkness tend to take advantage or sexualize someone's light. They saw the healing in my light and they sexualized it and they took advantage of it. And while I can see that now and understand it, how it could play itself out, um, then it, it, it changed me. It defined me. It didn't even change me. It was how I was brought up. It was how I was truly defined as a child. So there was no self-worth. There was only sexual worth. Um, so going into that in grade school and middle school, the only way that I could please someone, please a boy, please a man was to be a sexual object. So, um, having that ingrained in me from a young person, I stopped at 13 because I just started having sex and being so young and making those type of decisions and the people who were engaging with me, most of which were men. Um, it was, it was a, a complete cry for help, but I was silenced because I had no one to really talk to. I grew up very religious. Um, my family would have looked at me like, you know, what did, what did you do? What were you wearing? What did you say? And Oof. there was no way for me to be able to express that. Now, as a parent or as a parent and as a person who has gone through it, I know the signs to look out for, but not everybody does. No. And a lot of times they will ignore it because that's a big, tall order for someone who's already broken, uh, who hasn't dealt with their own issues. I feel like my generation is the first generation in a very long time that has the ability to reconcile our issues. Mm-hmm. Um, baby boomers didn't have that opportunity. They had to work. They had to provide. They had to pass along the torch of their parents who had seven, eight, nine, ten 10 kids um, who were then trying to just give their kids an education or give them a nice place to stay. They had to work long hours and the kids were just, we were all lock, lock key kids yeah. figuring it out for ourselves. So after I went, I was in acting, I was in performing arts because I've always been a very gregarious kid and, and lots of personality. That was a way for me to express myself and kind of get out some of that energy. Um, I moved like 13, on. At about, at about, about, around 13. Mm-hmm. about that time, I was in acting troops and I modeled and I, I did a bunch of stuff in the performing arts world. I went to the pro- a performing arts high school, which was great. I met my husband there, um, and, and which is kind of crazy in itself, but uh, we both have gone through situations where we have dealt with our own brokenness and we've helped each other through those circumstances, um, which is again, why my healing has been so profound because I've, I've, I found help, I found love in a very real place. Yeah. And then I kind of went through uh, college Um, another performing arts group, but I had my first real counseling session. The first time I had, I was able to tell someone everything and let it all out. It was the first time you told your story. 
first time I was really able to express it in a way that someone listened and validated me and said, it's not your fault. Um, so that was amazing. Um, I, I learned a lot about myself as a person, as a, as a woman, I learned a little bit about my worth. And I think my first time I, I actually felt what self-esteem felt like just a glimmer of it, the, the iceberg, I was probably 23 years old. Good God. And at that point in my life, I, I had my first child. I got involved with someone who um, was not my equal, who um, was satisfying to me sexually. And, and I was attracted to and was attracted to me. And, and that felt like love because it wasn't as forceful as some of the experiences I had in the past. Um, and that's when I wrote my book. I started writing my book, How to Deal with Your Baby Daddy because there weren't any books out there um, to de really describe how to deal with a co-parenting situation rooted in someone you didn't marry or you didn't really truly have love for because I didn't know what love was, like real love. Um, I had to find that through trial and error. And then it took me eight years to finish that book as well because I realized as I went back and forth with this man continuing yeah, to- you were learning as you write. Yeah. I was learning as I went along. So I finally felt like I had enough material to be able to give someone a sense of what I had actually gone through and how to reconcile that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough coaching to give. I just knew I had passion for people to help and support. And so I think it was, it was in my book, I have a, <laughs> I have a, a chapter called let it go to voicemail because I continuously went back to this man in various ways. Uh, I had three children by him, it should have been four. I, by the fourth child said, I can't do this. And again, being very religious, when I got pregnant the third time, because I have a set of twins with him, uh, I said, I can't, I, I, I'm gonna commit the worst sin of my entire life and terminate my pregnancy, my fourth pregnancy, and the third pregnancy with him. And it was devastating. It was life changing, I was 27 years old. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing to you? God hates you. You're going to hell. Um, you, no one will ever love you. You've got all these kids. No one will ever marry you. This was the, the, yeah. the self-talk in my head. Really? So no matter what accomplishments I had, I mean, I was on television at that point. I had major commercials. Doesn't I had matter, lots matter. going on. It didn't matter. I had degrees. I bought my first house. Like I was 24 years old when all that happened. But all that, I looked cute. Like I was, girl body was banging. I was cute. But none of that uh, mattered because it was just 24. a facade. That's it was, 24. Oh man, exactly. Uh. It was a facade of happiness rooted in me desiring acceptance. And so I got involved in church because I was like, well, maybe God will redeem me if I work in church. Um, and that was a train wreck. Uh, that's a whole nother podcast, girl. Church hurt is real. But yep. I, yeah, my, my, thing, yeah my, my husband yeah. has experiences with church hurt. <laughs> We, we've, we, we all have, unfortunately, mm. who, who's ever worked in a church and really has seen the veil lifted. That's it's, another it's, whole podcast, it's, for sure. Uh, it's a whole, I'll come back, girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the saving grace for me was at that moment, um, two of my girlfriends who had been through similar experiences, whom mm. had them years before terminated pregnancies, who I went to to be my solace in that moment, whereas I damned them and said, well, you know, God's going to have to deal with you. They were there for me yeah. in a profound way that I couldn't even explain because my religiosity was at the forefront of my judgment of them. And in that moment where I was faced with the same thing that I had then damned them to hell for, I was like, wow, God, you are teaching me in this moment to never judge because I know the Bible says judge least not be judged. However, church people are judgmental and I was one of them. So I had to As a examine my own dogma. I Absolutely. I, I, I had to examine my own dogma and realize that my religiosity was not serving me. Yeah. And the whole concept of doing what serves you versus what doesn't, that's a concept I didn't understand till Reiki. And that changed my life in so many profound ways. So mm -hmm. our mutual friend, Solani, uh, Solani Love, who is just a, an amazing woman yes. of, of ridiculous light. We had been friends since we were about 27 years old. Before Solani's now. a teacher. Yeah. Solani was the one who recommended yes. that I find to her. And she's like, you got to talk to this woman. Yes, I have to talk about her because she, um, she, she taught me she reminded me mm. of my self-worth. She healed me uh, with her light. And she keeps telling me, no, it was you. It was your desire to be healed. And I, and I received mm. that. But I credit her for her willingness to give of her talent um, because it literally set me on a new trajectory. <sighs> um, 
it was no longer about my accomplishments. It was no longer about what I could prove to the world that I'm a good person and worthy of love. It was the discovery that it's been in me the entire time. Like every, at the end of every Disney movie, uh-huh. it was in me the whole time. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so we still don't get I, it. Still, it, it, but it, everybody has to have their aha moment. Yeah, so huh. one of my styles as a life coach, I believe in the self-soothe. I am not here to tell you about yourself Uh in order to make you feel bad about what you've done in order to change your behavior. I'm here to encourage and inspire you with conversation so that you can come up with your best solution for whatever you're experiencing that is not serving you. And it really is about serving self. That's where self-worth comes from. Serving the the atoms and the energy and the love that is deep rooted inside of the five-year-old you that had no cares or filters yeah. and getting to that little girl or that little boy for them to open up into the failures and successes and life living properties and principles that happen every day with Mm -hmm. everything from brushing your teeth to getting in your car and driving to your destination. It's all purposeful and it's Mm -hmm. all worth it. Yeah. So we've just done a whole hour's worth of podcasts in 23 <laughs> minutes. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> like, I was like, where do we begin? That was what? the condensed and version, girl. Like, that's where you begin. Oh, we're, we're already going all the way through to the end. So let's, oh, break, let's break it down into bits if we yeah. can. And if you don't mind, I'm yeah. just going to go back because I love the insight that you have that if there's someone who's listening here who knows a child who's in danger or, you know, what are the signs, you know, what was the environment in? Like, I don't, I'm, my mind is blown by how you could have been in this situation in the first place. Like, how could you have possibly been in the situation where you were being used by that many people? Like, how does this happen? (sighs) That's a loaded question. (laughs) And, you know, I, I'm going to answer by saying, um, trust our parents trust people to be with us, to, um, not be around us. Um, my mother and my father were hardworking people, Mm -hmm. um, and they had to work. And again, being latchkey kids, I think every kid of the 80 was a latchkey kid. I do not blame my yeah. mother for, or my father for what happened to me. But I also yeah. understand that in their pursuit of doing more for their children yes. than they receive, oftentimes our children are left with people that they trust. And that does not equate that, equate that they are trustworthy. And so I went to private school and okay, they're all about God and Jesus. And Jesus is all about saving the children, right? He loves the little children, but not everybody at church is saved and not everybody in a private school or, or, or a Catholic school, I went to Catholic school, um, is, is, has got the best intentions. And we all know about the Catholic, um, denomination in general and how much scandal is there with, with the molesting of children. And I was just another victim of that. And so between school um, relatives. By the time I was a teenager, it was just like, well, you're at school. I got a pager. <laughs> I got a home phone. So I'd make calls or just walking around the street. I was stacked from the time I was like 10 on. And I was a tomboy. So I was unaware. So half the time I didn't wear a bra. Not yeah, that it's my yeah, fault, yeah. but I just was unaware of myself because I was just like, well, who wants to play basketball? <laughs> you what? know? So did you, know, you just, didn't, you didn't see it as being anything wrong at the time at certain moments? Uh, I absolutely saw it as wrong. And that's where my prayer life developed because I would just pray and be like, God, forgive me for what I did. Mentalize. Exactly. It was a separation because remember that was my purpose. I learned from three years old that I was a sexual object, a sexual being to be used by others. So that's my earliest memory. My earliest memory was that. And so as a child, what do you wish that you had have done? when you became aware of it being wrong? What do you wish that you could have said, acted on? Like, what do you ever think about? I'm sure you think about that. Um, I know for a fact that as a child, you would never think to say anything. That's why it's, it's a diligence of the parents and the adults in the room to notice behaviors of, of children. And oftentimes we're tired. We're not thinking about it. We're just trying to keep everybody safe. Yeah. But our safety doesn't end with them playing kickball and falling down and hurting and scraping their knees. Yeah. Our safety it starts and ends with boys and girls being in the same room or assuming that because they're girls, they can go in the bathroom together. 
that's there's a lot of kids who are discovering their sexuality. Yes, we misconceive yes. children as not being sexual beings when they absolutely are sexual beings. Of they course. are learning their sexuality. And my husband and I talk about this all the time. We're not raising children. We're raising adults because yes. they're going to be adults way longer than their children. And we have to arm our children with the tools. We don't want to ruin their innocence, but we must give oh. them the tools to be able to protect themselves. And uh, oftentimes and sometimes they're not even comfortable enough saying something when they know they can come to you. That's right. I didn't necessarily know that I could go to my parents, but even if I could, I felt wrong. It was my doing. Ugh. I was not the victim. I was the perpetrator because look at me. I looked a certain way or my, my breasts were out or in some type of way. So by the time I was 14, I was on a diet and I'd lost a bunch of weight, but the boobs and the butt stayed there. So I wore tighter clothes as I was happy about my body, but I didn't know what that was attracting as if that should have been an excuse. But in the 80s, 90s world that we were in, it absolutely was my fault. So dang we have to change the narrative from this matriarchal society that yeah. suggests that if a woman is dressed a certain way, she's asking for it. That's and that's right. absolutely the world that yeah. I came what from. What were you so, wearing? What did you do to encourage absolutely. them? So you absolutely. had this self-worth and awareness of your, your beauty, your shine. So there yeah. was self-worth oh, yeah. there, but a, a disconnect that you actually valued it. Absolutely. Well, I wasn't taught to value it mm. in that way. Mm. I was taught to see myself as a child of God and as a person who was there for his glory, but still a speck of dust in the grand scheme of things, nothing without him. So if I'm already nothing and I'm getting treated like nothing, the, 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 the rhetoric in, uh, surrounding Christianity is to make people feel like God is is this only, well, Jesus is the only thing that you need to survive. Like literally there are women who would rather marry Jesus than a man because he's the only thing that they need to survive. Mm. And to unlearn that is difficult when it's been a part of your culture. I'm a black woman in America. It's a part of our history. It's a part yeah. of our heritage, a part of our culture at this point in this country. Mm. So even trying to disconnect from that is really hard because that's my identity. That's, that's taking away from me as an African-American woman. Yeah. What to so, do without, what would you be without it? Literally you know. an agnostic, you know, ostracized. I already married a white man. I'm already ostracized because I'm in a biracial <laughs> interracial relationship. So this was further ostracizing because that's where a lot of networking happens. Yeah. So I, uh, to take myself out of that world was yet another blow to my eccentric nature. I'm already weird. So this is just adding to it. So I just stay quiet. Right. And I just accept it because this is what I'm supposed to do. My, my, my grandparents were Southern. You know, I'm a good Southern girl. Um, and I, I have to put that front up. So it, it was tough. Um, my mother and I have had many conversations about this and this is a very sore subject for her. I mean, I love my mother. I'm and I always sure. have, She knows the whole crazy. deal. At and this what, point, she, she does. And what she missed. And, 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 and that's the part that we don't have a connection as far as seeing eye to eye on that, which is very difficult for her because my mother prides herself in being a good mother to us. She did so much. She provided so much. Again, putting us in private schools, you know, trying to increase our value in life, giving us education, et cetera. Um, but there were some things that were missed. And me living in my truth means I have to hurt her feelings from time to time, yeah. which is really hard for me to do because I'm a mama's girl. Like of I love course. my mother more than anything. And we, we've, 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 we've had to butt heads, but I have to live in my truth, even if that means her feelings. And, and that's been difficult. I, I'd say we've been on this journey for the last three or four years with mm -hmm. me expressing my truth and, and, you know, she feels the need to defend herself. And I'm like, mom, it's just not about you. Unfortunately, I, I know that you feel like, like you're being, dra you know, dragged in, in uh. you know, on the ground, but it's, it's not about you. And so I have to let her deal with her emotions about this, but I have people to help. And I, and I, it, the grand scheme of things is much greater. My purpose is much greater in helping people with this truth yeah. than sharing her feelings, unfortunately. So that's hard. If there is anyone out there who's listening who is a parent, is it just the the general basic things of like the, the you know the young girl starts to become shy or more aware of her body? Like what are the things that parents should be keeping their eyes out for? What are they missing? What should we be looking at? Absolutely. They're behavioral changes. Mm. Uh, every kid has a pattern. Mm. If they begin to alter their patterns or they're alone more often than not, um, they're, they're not as talkative as they once were, or they talk a lot or they're very expressive and they weren't very expressive before. Yeah. Um, the way a, a, a young girl sits, like I have three daughters, so I'm always on, 
you got their legs spread all open, you got a dress on, excuse me, close those legs, put them down, you have a dress on. Not because you're putting yourself out there in a way, but this is how you can protect yourself. Yeah. Um, so behavioral changes is going to be the biggest thing. Yeah. I, when I was five years old, I remember distinctly being caught in a room that I was in by myself yeah. masturbating. And the lady who mother? came in and stopped, oh, no, just, by, just, no, 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 by, by a babysitter. It was a babysitter. It was a daycare. And mm-hmm. I remember masturbating up a storm and she came in, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. And she said, okay. And left. And made you like, wrong. Well, she didn't even say anything to me, but I would have been like, no, what's going on? Let's, you're not in trouble. Let's talk. What, what's happening? I see that you were doing something. Were you touching yourself? How did that feel? What I would go through a line of questioning to kind of help them ease the, 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 the thought that they may be in trouble for what they may have been doing, but understand that your feelings are valid. Um, that probably felt good. Did you see that from someone else or is this something to do for yourself because it's not abnormal to be in touch with one's body that's not abnormal but when it's when it when you're most children for that level of touch have to be introduced yes and usually introduced it's either another child or a grown-up or something they've seen that was inappropriate so then parents have to then alter their the kid's environment yeah i've had these conversations with all of my children many many times Uh, i started i remember asking my daughters at six years old my twins what do you know about sex? That was my only question. What do you know about sex? And I privately asked each of them and they had answers. And whatever their answers were, they had answers, which means they know something, Something. which means it's never too early to talk to kids about what they know because you're going to teach them or someone else will. And I have friends of my family of mine who are like, "Uh uh-uh, that's too early. Oh no. And therein lies the problem. Exactly. It's a different world. I mean, even back then when they're saying, oh, no, it's too early, it was still happening then, which is why there's so many problems as grown-ups. You know, exactly. can't get your sexuality right, don't know how to connect yeah. with people, don't know how to take care of yeah. your kids. Did you have yeah. a problem? Like, did you have real it, – it, was it hard for you to take control of your own sexuality and your own pleasure? Like, was that – that's also a whole other, you know, oh, yes, full of work. <laughs> That is an entire other podcast. podcast. But yeah, <laughs> I'll give you a brief, brief synopsis because I am a carefree spirit. I, I consider myself, what is it? Um, homeo sapio? Homeo, what is, I don't even remember the name for it, yeah. but where you're, you're not attracted to sexuality, you're attracted to people. And for me as a young person, I went in thinking something was wrong with me because remember I was molested by guys and girls. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm gay, but now I really can't say anything because that's against God's law too. Yes. And really the reality was I wasn't gay. I was just introduced to sexuality way too young. Mm-hmm. And it took me till after college to sort out what that meant. Yeah. Um, and to figure out what, what pleasure was for me and yeah. to me, I think the first time I had real true pleasure sexually, mm. I was really older. I was probably 28, yeah. 29 years old. Yeah. Um, because it was a mutual situation where I was with a giver yeah. for the first time in my life. Ugh. And it was, it was mind blowing. And then my relationship with my husband, my husband and I got together. We, we broke up in high school and got back together when we were 31 years old. <laughs> and it was, he, I talk about him at the end of my, my first book, sex with him was amazing. Not because he was, you know, uh, magic Mike, but because he, he showed me what real love felt like and love in so many people's minds is a feeling, but love is more than a feeling. It is a connectivity Mm. rooted in, um, focus, focusing on understanding self and how yourself interacts with themselves, their selves. Um, and, and connecting on a, on an energetic level of care and, and, and sharing in self-worth, yes. not me making you feel good about yourself, but me enjoying you feeling good about exactly. yourself. And we had that. We worked through so many self-worth issues together and it, it made such a beautiful connection to the point where that's when I realized that's what making love is. Mm-hmm. I had never made love before. Mm-hmm. I had had plenty of sex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, it, it re- helped me redefine who I was. Yeah. And and one more note, because um, talking about him at the end of my book, I remember sharing my book with him. I had a friend who was helping me to proofread mm. and she read my book. She's like, you're not going to share this with your husband, right? <laughs> I was like, why of wouldn't course. I? It had, it had all my secrets, every secret, everything you could ever need to know about me from my past is in my book. I've published it. Fantastic. I've 
told my truth. No one else can tell it for me. No one can make me feel bad about it. It is what it is. So now I freely talk about it. That's a superpower. Not only Sharing vulnerability superpower. is like the most powerful thing anybody can do. So powerful. And oh. not only did he not damn me to hell like I expected from my past, <laughs> he encouraged me to write more Love of that. myself. So my first three chapters of my book were after me reworking it after my husband read it and said, you haven't told your whole truth. I need you to say everything. Ugh. So he empowered me. Good That's man. when I found out what real love felt like. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So your writing, you said when you were about 13, I think you said the, the first time that you started actually speaking or you know, sitting down with yourself and your feelings and your truth was in your journals. Yes, so, no, I was nine. Yeah. Nine. Nine. Yeah. So, I mean, communication and, and writing and connecting to your artistic self saved your life in many ways, right? As it oh my does God. with all of us. Yes. And, and I tell people that all the time, you know, it's funny, my, my kids having a life coach as a mom, it's like having a minister as a mom. You just don't listen, which is fine. I got of plenty of aunties for them to go to, to <laughs> hear it from them instead of me. Go to your friends. I don't care. I just want to make sure that you hear what you need to hear in order to, to reconcile with self. But I've encouraged my kids. They're so creative. All of them are so creative yeah. to write. My son's a rapper. My other daughter, she writes like a crazy person. She, she's got books already. And my other daughter's a dancer and she expresses yeah. herself that way. And my other daughter, she's just creative all around. She's just a little kooky kid. And I love that because we're all able to reconcile with ourselves artistically, which is the the highest form of self-love because yeah. at some point you can, you can either give it away or you can sell it because everybody's looking for that way out, yeah. that song that's going to make them feel or that piece sure. of that artistry that makes them see things in a different light. And so that that's been my saving grace for sure. And that's where it began. Your journey to self-worth began with you actually doing a creative output of some kind where you could get reflected you back, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's really important. And so let me ask you this. Since then you've moved on to, I mean, there's really no expression that you haven't challenged yourself to attempt, right? You, everything, unless you're going to go and sell some paintings, but I'm pretty sure you've done that too. But <laughs> where did you, where did that come from? Right. And, 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 do you ever think about the outcome or are you just doing it because the sheer act of expressing is the healing? Man, that's a great question. Um, I don't think one can get to the place where the act of sharing is the healing until they have gone through a process to recognize that's what it's doing. Yeah. I, I know we're talking about my pain in, in my past, but I had a great childhood in a lot of different ways. I see. Um, I was always into sports. I played, played rugby when I was in college. And I, I remember seeing pictures of me when I was in my slip and my pajamas because we had slips back then when we wore dresses. I used to love wearing my slip because it was like a skirt and it was cute. My little stockings and my little heels with a microphone and I would sing Michael Jackson and, um, you know, perform for my family. So yeah. it's always been in me to like express, yep. but express with a purpose came later and you know I think that it, I connected the two once I started to see it made sense so my album that came out earlier this year I've been working on the album for 10 years <laughs> at least 10 years and everybody's like when your album coming out when is when your album coming out and I was like I don't know and I prolonged it as long as I possibly could I was like damn it before I turn 40 this album is coming out you no know, if ands or buts I don't care if it's got flaws to it I just I want to make sure that whatever I put out is, is excellent. I'm all about black excellence all day long, every day. And mm -hmm. so I didn't want it. I don't want a half baked version of myself. I want it, this to be truly a, a, um, a reckoning to everything that I experienced over the last 39 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And it was the coming together of the, the reflection, as you talk about with my husband kind of shining that light on my face and being my second set of eyes to see what I'd been missing in myself and him being my partner in crime. Like we just can do no wrong. Like mm. it just, it's golden because he empowers me to just be myself mm -hmm. and it's never failed us. And, and, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. It's just really wonderful to have that, that partnership. What's his name? And that support. Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin Christie. Thanks Benjamin <laughs> for being such an angel. Yeah. A man, man. He is. Oh my God. My husband came in. I had, I was a single mom with three kids and he came in like a little white knight. Well, big white knight on a very shiny <laughs> horse. 
And he saved my life. And he was like, I'm just a homeless truck driver. And literally he was a homeless truck driver. No way. <laughs> yeah, he was, he, he I, his journey is also another podcast, but um, he had, was in rehab for uh, about six and a half years. Uh-huh. And, you know, we had stopped talking to each other from high school because he broke up with me in high school, which is a whole nother thing. But he finally got me to love him, broke up with me, got in trouble with the law, ended up going to jail, decided if he was going to go to jail or go to rehab, he chose rehab. Yeah. He's supposed to go over there for two years. He stayed for six and a half because he was giving back to the organization that gave him his life back. Ugh. And then the day that he graduated from that program, he called me and I'm like, yo, yeah, I'm not into any of that. Do you know who I am? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then through a series of bamboozling uh, dates and interactions, he convinced me to date him and marry him. And here we are eight years later, nine years oh, total later. <laughs> heaven so what is that but, like like how, how is your experience you were saying there's 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 trouble it's difficult for you to live in a blended yeah. relationship like this what do you yeah. go through oh man well first of all you know we're in south orange county so yeah. the amazing look and stairs uh is awesome and we get as, as much love as we get Still? like you know, oh yeah Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. I mean, I don't I get mean, to see that. So I'm really interested yeah. to, to know what that spirit experience is like for you guys. Well, having the Black Lives Matter movement happen just a few months ago yeah. and us going out to rallies and protests and, and, and hearing the hate from the Trump loving Republicans that were just not OK with um, black people wanting to just matter, the bare basic of life. Right. Um, you got that. to see the hate that exists in the world. But we got as much love, if not more love from people who I didn't even know could be allies or were allies. I'm impressed with the amount of um, aligning that has happened with yeah. other communities that care about people of color. And, and it's beautiful to see. And so people in general. Um, so you, for me, it's, it's when we were younger, growing up in Oakland, California, my husband being a minority there, uh, it was interesting. Cause I'm like, of all the white people you could be with, why are you trying to be with me? Like, what, <laughs> what is this thing you got going on? I'm like, I'm not into the pasty Christy, pale. Right? Christy. Christy. <laughs> I'm not into that. But he was so into me. And, and even with, again, when we dated in high school, cause I was the actor and the dancer and the singer, and he was um, a musician. So he plays all kinds of instruments and everything. So we were always talented. Talented. And, you know, he would just watch me and I was just like, dude, why are you staring? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we our, our souls connected, honestly, because we couldn't be more different. He is. A, he was when we met again the second time, he was a vegan rock and roller truck driver. And I was a highly educated, you know, diva <laughs> who was very well respected in the community. Yeah. I can't date a truck driver. I can't date a truck driver. I can't date somebody who's not graduated from college. I can't, I just can't date your white. Like I can't yeah. date you at all. So when I say he was like, yeah, you can, and you will. And his confidence is ridiculous, which I love. Uh, um, he was the only man that even qualified to be with me because he knew what he wanted and he was willing to do whatever he needed to do to get it. And he proved himself to me over and over and over again to the point I was like, fine, I will date you. <laughs> and then I fell in love. And now there's no turning back. I love that. He knew his self-worth from the get. Oh, he did. He did. Let me talk to you about your um, uh, nonprofit and yeah. how you help, you know, underserved communities. Like, talk to me about, are you helping a lot of people who have, and women, women and men who have been through the same experience as you? Uh, are you focused on, on, on that at certain particular times or is it just in general trying to help people find their self-worth and their confidence and their purpose and their passion in life? I am all a big proponent above. of helping all, all of the above. <laughs> I want to help everybody. Yeah. But my passion lies in women, why I'm a woman. And I feel like as women, we are to guide one another. I feel like I have a ton of men who can focus on young men and boys and, and be an example to them. But having three daughters, I felt like it, when I had my son first and I had three daughters, I was like, okay, God, you got jokes. Cause I know what to do with these girls, but the reality is God is all knowing and knows what he's doing. And I had these beautiful girls because I am the example for them. And I feel like I'm a really good example for them. So I embrace women who have been, who are underprivileged, who have been in um, predicaments that they don't know what to do. Um, I would go to a lot of halfway houses and rehabs and uh, homeless shelters. And I give away my book and I talk to these women about their self-worth. I'm not there to judge them. And well, you, you're you in trouble with the law and this is what happened to you. And I, I love talking to the women who are either pregnant or just had their babies in the halfway houses because they felt like they've messed up. And it can take 
one drink or one run in with the law and then they lose their kids again forever or for a longer period of time. And those are the women who need the most support. They need to understand that there's a way out. They need to understand that people like me, so to speak, that have educations, that have resources and we're we're dealing with the same issue. We have the same type of past. The only difference is I chose a different direction at some crux in my my journey. And they have the ability to change at any time. They have the ability to move. And so for me, the passion behind what I've been through to be able to help somebody else to see that there is another way, that it is possible that you can find success after failure is why I'm motivated to talk to these communities. Because I talk to women who have lots of money and status and they're just as broken as these women who have nothing. Sure, sure. And being a part of church is really what taught me that. Cause I thought well, you're a millionaire, you're a multi, you're damn near a billionaire and you're jealous of me. It didn't make any sense to me. None at all. Cause I'm like, give money. I don't have like I don't have what you have, but it's not about that. That self-worth is rooted in who you think you are. Mm-hmm. And we all need to figure that out. That is the journey, not to be the most successful or have the most likes or the clicks and all that other crap. That's all superficial. and does nothing for the grand scheme of things. No. Um, it's so out they're my in. passion. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you teach that? (laughs) So I, through stories, through, through honesty, first of all, I'm probably the most honest person you'll ever meet. And sometimes it hurts people's feelings. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It doesn't eventually (laughs) though. I'm sure it's just shocking, right? But it's so rare. Right. It is so rare. And that's why people flock to me and they're, and, and they're attracted to my light. And, and my job is just to continue to reflect that light back. Yeah. I love it when my daughters come to me like, mom, you were right. I was like, I, I wasn't I trying know. to be, I just, <laughs> but I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I think that is yes. where people misstrew what love really is. They think love is feeling good. No, love is truth. In, in its worst form and in, in its best form. So you have to accept it all. My, my slogan for 2020 is count it all joy. You know, I want everything to be joyful, even if it's in pain. Like, what can we learn from this situation? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm delving into the start of what the shadow is. You know, yes. understanding, you know, my place in the creation of the darkness and finding out what I dig about it and why it's coming you know finding the gratitude in 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 all of it no matter how horrible it might be right now your healing is in the shadow absolutely 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 Mm -hmm. so how do you then I'm really interested right in because I know we all have our days and our self-worth is you know without that there is nothing that you can step off the ledge and go I'm going to do it. You know, you just can't yeah. without it. And so yeah. when did it, what's your mantra? What's the thing that you remind yourself when you fall off or, you know, and the crux that you said, you know, when you mm-hmm. shifted, what was it? What What was your action? What did you do that was different? When did you go, aha? Uh-huh. That's that's a, a great question. It's loaded. <laughs> I think that th- those moments happen often. I don't think it stops happening. I think the, the biggest takeaway for me um, is the fact that I respect the processes mm-hmm. that are constantly flowing in my life. And my mantra, I would say, would be I'm either in a process, just coming out of a process or about to go into a process. <laughs> so I might as well enjoy the ride. There is no goal. There is no end. There There's is no, no yeah. goal. There's this is it. Smart. And and when you understand that, yes. my, my mentor, her name was Risa Booker. She passed away earlier this year. And, and, and I was talking to you about her oh, the other day. She amazing. Oh, she just look her up. She's just amazing. Risa um, Booker. Yes. W R I S E. And, um, she was a leadership coach and a guide and she kind of just started talking to me one day and I didn't know who I was talking back to. I didn't know who she was because she's a big person and I'm just, I was just a little small old me right in my mind. And she taught me how to accept my process and to not seek the end or the goal of a process. Yeah. We can make goals. I'm a goal oriented person. I was yeah. in sales, corporate sales for uh-huh. many years. So it's always about not what you did, what are you doing to get to the next goal? Yeah. Metrics, metrics, metrics. It's, there's no goal here. The, the, the understanding of where you are, like right now I am 
in a good place, right? But I know at some point this part of that good place is going to end and then some issue will come about that will force me to examine where I'm at and to yeah. shift, to the pivot, right? To on a dime. So new ones can grow. Exactly. And one one uh, motivational speaker I was listening to years and years ago said, if you incorporate four crises in your life every year, then you won't be surprised by them and you'll know how to respond to them. And so not saying that I want to attract, I don't want to attract (laughs) negativity to my life, but I'm a mother of four kids. I I own a home in South Orange County. Stuff happens, right? So when things happen, I'm like, okay, that was number one. Okay. That was, that was two. So you're in between. Absolutely. You keep yourself focused and, um, and you just keep going. You can, but, but don't forget to pause and be present for that moment. Understand that everything happens for a reason. It's to teach you or to gratify you in some type of way. It's one of the two. It's, there's no try. There's no in between. It's one or the other. There's only and, two. and if you're, there's only two, you're either being rewarded or you're being reprimanded. So either if you're being reprimanded, shift and adjust that behavior so that it can turn into a reward. And if you're being rewarded, rewarded, share it. Uh-huh. Do not reward yourself or be rewarded just to be like, oh, I'm rewarded. Look at me. Mm-hmm. If you don't share it, you will immediately or at some point lose it. Yeah. For me, that is the key to a successful Self- life. And self-worth. Oh, my God. The giving of someone Absolutely. else is just like it's overpowering how good that feels. Yes. yes. Oh, that's good. And, advice. That's, it's the blessing of life. Uh Uh-huh. I love that. Where is your next place that you uh, intend to go and share your light with your nonprofit? So my nonprofit, because of COVID, shifted from me doing services Uh and going and doing conferences. I had a retreat booked in in April where I was going to take women into a house and we were going to cry and laugh and love on each other. I had to 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 postpone those things. And I said, well, how can I support women and love on people in in a in a way that's going to bring profit to my home? Because I lost my job and there was a lot going on. So I'm really into energy and really into Reiki. I created a couple of smudge sprays, like a lavender one and a sage one. And I was like, I'll put these on Etsy. It was cool. And I got maybe one sale every week. And it was okay. It's a start. And then my mom called me. She's like, you need to make hand sanitizer. This was back in March. I was like, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, just, I made it. And I was like, I got to get bottles. I got to get the alcohol. I got, so I got everything. The first day I put it up, I sold 30. And then the next day I sold 120. Okay. I was like, oh my God, this is a thing. So I had my little Reiki bottles and I had my hand sanitizer. And then that first month I brought in like almost $25,000. What? And I said, yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. It was amazing. And I worked like a dog. It was crazy. Cause it was, yeah, that was a crazy time, but it was beautiful because it was the seed money for me to be able to create so many other things. So I literally just went into my lab, which is my garage. And I started cultivating. I started making candles. I started making soap. I started making lotions and potions and you name it. I made it girl. And it was amazing because my whole brand, a more probe um, is self self worth, self love. And my slogan is live in love. And I'm able to give love to people of my handmade products and little sayings. I'll write little things to just, just share myself and share, you know, nature with people because that's where our healing is, is in what was created for us Mm. by God. And it's my way of loving on people. Mm. And so I've shifted from service to product and it's all under the guidelines of my nonprofit. So since I've made all this money, I'm now able to give it away. Beautiful. So I've gone to different places. I give away hand sanitizers. I've been a few different, pro- the protests having come up. I was like, you guys need to clean your hands. <laughs> so it's been amazing. I've just been able to give it away. So it's been a beautiful journey. It's been a beautiful journey. I love that. How, yeah. ha- how have you found, have you got any uh, examples or stories you can share of how you've inspired um, women of color in your community, like someone who like looks up to you and you've seen a change, like it, it must make you really proud. Um, oh, you, you just reminded me. I just got my little goosebumps. Um, so I've been going to these, uh, halfway houses, um, for gosh, about five years now. And the first year that I went there and I spoke to the women, um, I gave out my books and uh, all these women are, are mothers. That's why they're in this particular halfway house, homeless shelter, where they're trying to rehabilitate their lives. Mm. And there was one woman there in particular who was very talkative and she had a lot to say about, you know, the information I was sharing. I gave them my book and they had all kinds of questions. And 
I went back again, probably it was a year later that to that particular shelter. She wasn't there any longer. Fast forward to, was it this? It was the beginning of this year. So this is from five years ago to the beginning of this year. I got an email from a young woman who said, I don't know if you remember me, but I was in this particular shelter and she said, you, your book changed my life. And I, not only am I out, I got an email from UCI. So What's she's that? working at UCI, U- University of Irvine. Okay. So she was now working at the University of Irvine, making great money, <gasps> taking care of her daughter. She was the director of a program that they had. And she wanted me to come and share my books. She was like, I would love you to come. I'd love for you to speak. And I got to see her and embrace her. I didn't even recognize who she was. Because at the time that I, I knew her and met her, you know, she she looked like she was in a halfway house homeless shelter. She was clean. Her hair was nice. She had nice clothes on. She was with her colleagues. They would never have known her history. Oh. And I just cried. I was like, look at, like, if, if no one else benefited from my book that I worked on for eight years, it it was worth it. Oh my God. It just was so amazing to me. So that I'll never forget that. It just, it rocked my world and it's motivation to keep going. Even when I get down on myself or tired, because I do get tired, (laughs) do a lot. Look at all the things that you do. It's ridiculous. (laughs) It's absolutely ridiculous how many things you do with your life. (laughs) And have <laughs> well, I thank God for the, the ebbs and flows and the waves of life because, uh, you know, you can't do everything at once, but I've been able to dabble in everything and, and go back to the things that I really enjoy. And this is the part of the process. This is part of the journey. Just enjoy the whole thing as yeah. it goes and take, take in what you can. There's real value in that, I think, right? You know, real mm-hmm. value because we can get so, you know, myopic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and focused I always think of it this is another thing my teacher would say like you can start a fire if you focus a magnifying glass on the one thing like the whole thing will just exactly. like get you know burn but if you That's pull it out it. isn't it but if you pull yeah. it out it just warms everything you know yeah. so keep it on the on the keep it on the widescreen yes you know? so we're just not getting so so intent and they had to put blinkers on them, right? I have to remind myself not to put blinkers on. It's just like it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. You know. Uh, you're a real, you're a real reminder. You're a real reminder. What would you say if people are trying to find their superpower, right? How do we find that? How do we find that thing? Well, I, I love saying, you know. It- it's important for people to find out what their superpower is because we all have them. Um, if you look at most of the the Marvel superheroes, either they've come from another planet or they were some ordinary person that had something happen to them. Uh-huh. And as a result of what happened to them, they had to go through an agonizing reality that that's who they are. And then they had a love interest that had to accept them. And once they found that love for self and acceptance in society, they were able to shine. Right. So the same process applies to us. Love it. Um, we all have to dig deep and figure out what that itch is and we got to scratch it. Yeah. We got to figure out what that pain point is and we got to push into it. Uh When I got my healing, I I literally had my heart pushed into because that's where all my pain was. It was in my heart. That's where you carried it. That's where you felt it. Exactly. So all the energy had to come out of my heart in order for it to be filled with love Mm. and self-love because that self-love oozes into every other type of love. It really starts with you. And it's funny because one of my favorite books, the first line of it is, it's not about you. It's not about you, (laughs) but you have to learn you. (laughs) Yes. And it's true. It's It's not not about about you, you. but in the grand scheme of things, but in, in, in the reality, if you don't understand you or make it about you at some point in your existence, it can never be about anybody else. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. It's not selfish in order no. for you to expand into that. It, I, I mean, I think it's going to be about you for a good while. Yeah. You, know? you got to to love your neighbor as yourself. You yes. got to love yourself first. <laughs> oh my God. We're, I'm going to make sure that people know how they can find you, how they can find these books that you've written, yeah. which are so helpful. Did you want to talk about your baby daddy book? Um, but- Space for Us, a healing journey for women of color was specifically designed because I did a retreat um, where I invited women to come and do their healing and uh, work out their issues with self. Um, And we did the first one and it was amazing. There was a lot of healing and growth. And then I decided I wanted to supplement that retreat with my book. So I started creating the book in order for women to be able to write their story down. So it basically guides women through understanding their story 
peeling down the layers of their emotions so that they can understand their authentic self and love that self truly. So there's quotes from various women of color, from Mahala, um, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, et cetera, um, in order to encourage them and inspire them to tell their truth. So there's power in that. Um, so that that has been a, a beautiful journey for me. And that's the newest book that I'm able to, to give out to women to be able to encourage them to shift and pivot to their authentic selves. Yeah. But my How to Deal With Your Baby Daddy book um, was truly just my journey um, from, from point A all the way to where I am today in terms of dealing with self. The book talks about him. It's a sexy title, but the book is about you. It's yeah. about making sure that you learn to deal with yourself. So everything that I ever do is going to be centered in people understanding exactly. them. So many of us are walking around and have no clue who we are and how we fit in this world. We're trying to put star pegs into square holes and it's not working. Uh-huh. Be a star, girl. Stop yeah. trying to be a square. Oh. <laughs> yeah, already. Exactly. So he's another, this uh, baby daddy of yours is another example yeah. of, you know, <laughs> it, the universe trying to say, wake up, right? Absolutely. Just giving you another opportunity to figure out, you know, your self-worth it's isn't that so yeah. fascinating so you everything that you do I love that yeah I had I had to figure out why I chose him I had sex with a lot of people in my day why him why did I choose to procreate with him and why what I was your feel answer? I felt like he embodied every he was he was the physical manifestation of where I was emotionally I was I was a I was a broken person person yeah. seeking love and support. And so was he. Yeah. And at that particular time in my life, it didn't matter if it was going to be, it wasn't going to be him. It was going to be anybody who entered into my life at that particular time in my life. I was in such a transition yeah. that whomever showed me the right type of attention at that time was going to be my baby daddy. And for me, that that's really sad, but that's also the honest truth. Of course. So that's why I had to learn how to deal with me because yeah. now this poor guy has got all these kids with me and he can't stand me, but God bless him. My life is good. And God bless him. That's all I can say. Absolutely. So, you know, the reality is in learning to deal with myself, I learned how to deal with him and, and yeah. all I can do is bless him. So would you agree then? Uh, I don't even know how I came to this, but it, it seems like this is, this is what you're saying. Like if you don't figure out your own worth, if you don't come to terms and, and, and do the work and, you know, press the, press the heart, you know, until you can figure out exactly what your worth is so your vibration can, you know, expand, the person that you choose incorrectly to be with is going to vibrate on that same poor level, right? Perfectly. Right. Absolutely. You attract what you are. Yeah. So if you want to be better, you got to do better so yeah. that you can attract better. Because I, I get so tired of women who tell me, I just, I mean, the guys that I've been dating, they just, it ain't worth exactly. nothing. Well, honey. If you and feel like you, you ain't wonder. worth it, you're attracting yourself. Exactly. And then you wonder why. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if, you, if you want the man of your dreams, you've got to become your own dream human being. Exactly. In order to yep. attract that. Yeah. It's hard to see. But that's see. too simple. It's too simple. So people Is don't it? vibe with it because it's an easy concept. But, but we complicate work. things. It's the yeah. work to get there. It's yeah. so easy to say. Yeah, you know, but this self worth thing is—I I, I, mean—it's got to be the 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 you know the base of the pyramid. If you haven't got exactly. that, what's your foundation to build it on? So exactly. Then what is your what what are your top tips? Like, if you could you know distill this down into one of your smudge sprays, right? If you could just spray <laughs> on self worth, so then I buy some. <laughs> But what, yeah. what is it? What is your advice, you know, for whatever experience, you know, a, a woman or a girl or, or a man, a boy is happening Anybody. right now? Yeah. What do you do? How do you just go, how do you, how do you put the self-worth superhero cape on and move yeah. forward? So we'll keep it simple. Forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. Forgiveness. Whatever happens, just forgive it. Uh, Say, it's okay. Just, it's okay. I forgive you. Especially in the mirror, because that's the hardest part for a lot of people is self-forgiveness. Because those of us who are like, we're overachievers, we're really hard on ourselves. And to be truthful, and to with, actually say it and you go, oh. Yeah, yep. it's hard. It's really hard. I, I was really hard on myself for a long time and I learned to forgive me. Hmm. After forgiveness, grace. 
give yourself the grace to understand that even if you make a mistake and you're going to have to make up for that mistake and it will take time and energy and effort, provide yourself with grace so that you can get through it because it's another process, right? It's going to go and you're going to continue to experience it if you didn't learn from it. So if you want that process to stop or that cycle to end, you've got to do something different. And grace is probably one of those things after forgiveness that we have to apply. And then after grace, love. You can't learn to love yourself until you've forgiven yourself and you provided yourself with grace. You learn to love when you accept the good and the bad. Mm. We can see, I'll give you just an obvious example. Look at our president, right? What good can come of this person? A lot of good came out of his pregnant presidency, even though he is an evil, racist, misogynistic, sexist, et cetera, et cetera. Many people have started new businesses. Many people have spoken up and used their voices. We've spoken out against racism and sexism. We have shifted our, people have died, but we have learned to live. I am not giving him credit. I'm saying I've learned to love the good and the bad in all things. The yin and yang have to exist together. The dark and the light. Have to exist. Yes. He is Kronos, like for real. Um, (laughs) And after that, (laughs) then, then peace. Settle in into the peace that exists in understanding that you deserve forgiveness, grace, and love. And peace. And that peace will settle with you so that you understand that it's not just for the the, the Buddhists and in the temple, and it's not just for sure. the Christians in the church. It's for you to love yourself with and be be in be present and embrace even in your toughest times. Mm. You deserve peace of mind, peace of your yeah. heart, peace, 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 peace. And then give it so away, those, right? Oh and my God, give it away. Love. Like it comes into yeah. the love. It's a but, cycle. You just keep, you just keep doing it. Absolutely. Keep doing it. Yeah. Cause then it would feed itself the joy and yeah. the, the reflection of the worth, your self worth that you've been able to, you know, share with someone else reflects back and yeah, feeds it. That's beautiful. Absolutely. That's beautiful. I love that. I can actually visualize that, you know, and check yes. my behaviors during the day to go, yes. what was that? Okay. So mm-hmm. next is mm-hmm. this. All right. Mm-hmm. I like that. So everything worth, boils worth. down to that. It's very true. There are so many people who have gone through experiences in their life that are not half as challenging as what you have had to endure, which I think is why you're the perfect person to be doing the work that you're doing. Um, you. you know, the the voice that you have is so powerful because it comes from a place that I can only imagine, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just thank you for everything that, 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 that you're doing. And um, I hope the listeners, there's some little gem in there you know, for you to be able to either, you know, help someone else or look, if you have a, if you see just, I'm not throwing in there, if you see or know of some situation where there's a child in danger or, you know, a parent who, you know, might need to have a blinker taken off or anything at all, there's a, a child line in America, um, a child helpline. It's called 1-800-4-A-CHILD. It's the Child Help National Abuse Hotline. It's one 800 for a child or childhelp.org backslash hotline backslash. Um, it takes a tribe, you know, it takes all of us, you know, the gone are the days of us being, you know, thinking that, you know, the, our, our sharing or our truth or our honesty, you know, is, is not a place for someone else. You know, mm-hmm. I think the communication and the connection and the vulnerability and just the talking alone, like every, this, just you sharing this is is so powerful. And I, I think the more that we can see each other as, as tribe members, you know, yeah. as family, as human folk trying to help each other rise, trying to help each other get over our shame and our guilt and just get on with the bloody – Art of self-worth, for God's sake. We have so much to be grateful for and so many gifts and talents that reside in all of us. There's superhuman strength and a superhero that's in, in, in every single human being. You don't have to be, like you say, you know, a millionaire. You don't have to be uh, broken. We're all all of mm-hmm. those things. Yeah. And uh, I just think you're great. If you want to hear more from Tahera Renee Christie, she has a great podcast. It's called Filter Free. 
uh, obviously books and you can get her to come and talk for you. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, as I said, I'll drop all these uh, links down into the YouTube comments and uh, or, or the or the love lover more proper, the lovely skin line that you have. I mean, this woman does it all. <laughs> Take a leaf out of her book and just trust that you are such a beautiful human being. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your extraordinary you self with me. us. Really, really grateful. Really, really grateful. Um <laughs> Thank you so much to all of the viewers. Uh, you're extraordinary. Obviously, I want you. I want you to remember that and be reminded every single day. Uh, reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram or on the YouTube channel. Uh, thanks to my hot husband, Will Traval, for setting up all these lovely things and making me look beautiful. Uh, yeah. He sees me that way. I hope someone sees you that way too, because you certainly are beautiful and you certainly are an extraordinaire. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Extraordinaries Now's the time to share Yeah, yeah, yeah Extraordinaries We're all extraordinary